Welcome back to Globazan Podcast. Today's episode will be an interview with Navid Nasseri, 24-year-old attacking midfielder, currently playing for Linfield FC in the Northern Irish Football League. We'll speak about his time with the Man United youth setup and also the Iran U21 squad and much more. If you're listening to us on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and leave a like on the video. Hello, this is Navid Nasseri and you're listening to the Globazan Podcast. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Gold Bazan. My name's Sina and I'm joined by Arya and I'm also joined by our special guest, Navid Nasseri. Navid, how are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on. No, it's our absolute pleasure. And I haven't been personally like hosting the, the podcast for that long. So I haven't done that many interviews with, with players. So I think with you, I just kick off by saying, because you were born in, in the UK, right? You were born in England, same as same as me. Uh, Arya was born in Scotland. Are your, are your parents both Iranian? Uh, yeah, yeah. So both my parents are Iranian. Um, they moved over during the revolution um, and, you know, born and raised in Manchester. Um, so brought up in the Obregon and having the Persian background has, has always been, you know, important to me. Um, mm. It was my native tongue as well. So just having the kind of two cultures to, to grow side by side yeah. is, uh, is part of my personality. You like uh, Horma Sabzi? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Who doesn't? Wait, actually, our last episode is quite funny. We had someone who had our podcast open on our laptop, and they were just like eating horma sabzi in the background. It's quite funny. Yeah, I was like, that's the that most is. that's the most typical yeah. like Persian duo I've ever seen. Like our podcast and um, horma that was sabzi. my good friend Erfan. Shout out to him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, shout. Yeah. I retweeted it. It's quite funny. Horma um, sabzi and Golbazan. Yeah, iconic duo. <laughs> no, no better way to beat it. But I guess like for you, getting into football quite young like coming out and being you know brought up in Manchester becoming a football player something that you've always wanted to do was it something that you've always kind of had in your radar yeah absolutely you know growing up football has been my passion since I was a young boy um stems obviously I believe that from your parents can have a massive influence on you um, my father was a massive football man you know when he came to England he he loved football from from the days he was a teenager in Iran and coming over to the England he didn't have the facilities or the support system in order for himself to become a, a player or a top player. But what he then did, obviously, was um, kind of guided me through the stages and, and I had the resources and the facilities to, to utilise in England growing up um, and, and become a, an athlete and, and a football player. Yeah. So would you say the, the genes came from your father and then obviously all the motivation and stuff uh, mixed in with all the facilities and everything uh, helped you? Absolutely. Like, there's no doubt that you have to utilize and um, and maximize the things that you have around you growing up. You have to have a love for the sport. You have to have a passion for it. Um, But, you know, having that driving force of your parents beside you is is priceless. So, you know, as you said, the genes thing, I'm not saying my dad would have been a a world class player if he'd have played himself. (laughs) But he has, you know, some understanding of the game and he has the passion for the game, which definitely helps. Mm growing up for you, for you to get involved i guess like how how close are you with with your family in in iran like back home um yeah obviously uh, unfortunately like in terms of my grandparents um you know they're all late now um however you know my my dad's side my mom's side they still have family over there which they speak to quite regularly i wouldn't say they're i'm extremely close to them um but you know regularly when they're on facetime with my parents i'll you know stay in contact with them we have a lot of immediate family over in england as well now some in the states but the ones who are still in around we still you know stay in contact with regularly mm. so it's good like you you had like influence from both like i guess manchester as well as like iran so yeah, it seems like you had pretty pretty mixed up bringing. It's the same as us, really. Like Arya brought in Scott, brought up in Scotland. I was brought up in in London. Like pretty pretty similar in that respect. Farsian baladi, David. Bala Farsian baladi. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, that's quite that's quite a nice little accent you got there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying my best. I'm really interested with obviously I'm going to start off with Manchester United obviously I guess like you must have talked about it many times how did that come about like how did you actually start playing with them at youth level and like what did you what were the sort of key things that you learned from that experience obviously you know big clubs like Manchester United their scouting networks and the amount of kids they filter through through the years is is huge. Um, I think I got picked up from just playing local academies um, in my in my town area I'm in South Manchester. A scout had picked me up and asked me to come to a session, like an indoor an indoor session. You know, I was only maybe like eight years old. And then you know through those through those scouting sessions and the training sessions, you get asked to kind of advance onto the next age groups. So you know. The scouting systems, as I said, that these clubs have are absolutely enormous. And once you get yourself involved into them, it's, it's about trying to stay involved and staying at them because the competition is so high. Um, so, you know, growing up in Manchester obviously helps being a local boy. And then once once I was involved through the scouts, you know, I, I tried to maintain and, and stay there for as long as I could, which obviously at, at one stage you, you do get released and you have to move on and, and find another club. But um, the time you are there, you have to treasure it. You have to try and educate yourself and and develop as much as you can. Obviously, after your your time with Man United, you then moved on to kind of well known clubs in, in England. But you bounced around quite a lot, didn't you? Before, throughout the the country, you went to Crew Alexandra, Blackburn Rovers, Bury, Birmingham City, which was one of the most prevalent ones I think in your career. But what was the key things you take away from those four clubs? I mean, you know. Moving on from Manchester United, um, I spent, I think, a year at Crew. Being a young boy and through your development ages, especially when you're in high school, you're going to train with teams, you're going to trial with teams. I think that's all part of the development. And, you know, times where you would get knocked back, I think having that persistence and determination to not, like, let that hold you back. Because at the end of the day, I was still only young. I was a teenager. So, you know, going from 14, getting released from United and then going to Blackburn, going to Crew, And eventually, the, you know, I, I got my scholarship at Bury. I spent three years there and then in the end, um, you know, just because of how many, I, th- I think, first team managers I had, it was so difficult to break into the first team and earn a decent enough contract. I knew there was a few other clubs interested. So then moving on to Birmingham, throughout the whole stage, for me, it was just about developing and, and, and making sure I could become the best player I could be. It didn't really matter to me where that was. I needed to have a platform in order to develop. Now, of course, it would have been nice to stay at one club the whole time and develop under one coach. And so they knew my personality. But sometimes in life, you know, that, that doesn't happen in your career. You have to kind of move around in order to find your best, your best chances to, to yeah. improve. I, I want to ask you something. You're speaking about like, you obviously getting released at clubs, certain clubs. What's your opinion on that? Like, obviously, being a young player, teenager at various English clubs, well known like Blackburn Rovers. What's your opinion on a player getting released at that age? And what kind of support systems did they offer you? I mean, I know we're going to come on to your uh, time with the Iran U21s in a minute, and we'll speak about that. But with the English clubs, how did they support you with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Um... The support systems aren't great in the sense that, like, they filter through so many kids. You know, just looking at some statistics, I think it's 98% of players at the age of 16 to 18 no longer play. And then at the age of 18 to 21, 98% of those players then no longer play. Uh, You know, having the education system in place after the age of 16 improves a little bit because you're then dedicated to full time. But there is no kind of resources of them checking in, say, on your mental health. I know in 2021 now where people are huge on on supporting mental health but realistically having my family there personally and the the mentality that I had I didn't struggle with it too much there was definitely dark times but like you know I didn't struggle with too much but there is a lot of kids that I know or or friends that I've had who you know have struggled really physically and mentally from from getting released from clubs and ended up falling falling out the love with the game it's a big big shame in the UK especially even in Scotland like players getting released and there's no there's no support afterwards which is just ridiculous in my opinion as a 14-year-old kid getting released from, I guess, like, I guess Manchester United was probably your boyhood club. 14 is such a tender age. Like, it's it's crazy that's the first time you should face something like that. I guess, how did you kind of deal with that as, as, a, as a young person? And, and it, at the same time, how did you decide you wanted to carry on with this? Because when you face something so, I guess, harsh at, that, at such a young age, it could turn a lot of people off, especially, you know, when you're so young. Yeah, absolutely. You know, to be honest, personally speaking, from my experience, the pushbacks uh, or the knockbacks that I had at the age of 14 didn't actually affect me as much as they did when I was later in my teenage years. Um, And I think that was 
probably partially due to when you're young, you can see like you're so I, I believe I was still young and I had so much time ahead of myself where I was like 18, 19. And when contracts were finishing or, you know, things, you know, I had a big injury when I was 18. I'll discuss that at those times. That's when I really, really got like hurt when, you know, I, I didn't sign a new contract or I got released from a club, but it didn't happen. That was when it really affected me because I thought, oh, Jesus, I put so much into this. I put my blood, my sweat into this. And I was thinking, oh, like, is, is it not enough? What do I do next? So I feel like at the age of 14, I didn't actually take it as, as bad as I did later on in the teenage years. And I feel like a lot of players would probably relate to that and say when they are 18, 19, 20. And if you do get released at those stages, you're, you're then at a real big crossroads because you're, you're then a young adult. You're not, a, you're not a teenager anymore. You're not a young boy anymore where you have years and years to kind of mature and grow up and make a decision about your next move. Yeah, excellent. And of course, then you signed with Macclesfield. Was that your first professional contract with Macclesfield Town? No, well, actually, the, the Macclesfield thing is on my CV and a lot of people ask me about this. Macclesfield, I didn't officially play for them. There was no intention, I don't think, for me to play for them. I had done my cruciate when I was 18 years old and I didn't play for a whole year. It was in between when I had terminated my contract at Birmingham and I was looking for another club. I was supposed to go over to the MLS. And uh, Steve Watson was the assistant manager at Macclesfield Town at the time, and he was my assistant manager at Birmingham. So when I was doing my rehabilitation, I was coming towards the end of it, and I was training full-time with Macclesfield. And they had a game that they wanted to play me in, and I had to sign a contract in order for me to play in that game. So now on my CV, I have right, like, right. I have you know Macclesfield Town down as part of my career, um, which you know there was no, it was there was a. It wasn't even a part-time contract. I think it was just a, I could have ripped it up when I wanted to. There was no intention of me staying there. I played in that game and, and that was it. And then, but then you did make your professional debut with the Swe- a Swedish club. You moved all the way across Europe to Syrianska, a team that I don't know if anyone knows. Someone Gotus used to play there, I think a few years before you. This was in the second tier of um, Swedish football. You made 26 appearances, you scored two goals. Just let us know how that experience was for you. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, if I could go back, I would do it again as well. As I you know, finished my rehab uh, with my cruciate injury, I had the opportunity to go over to Sweden. Originally, I went and trained with AIK, which is you know one of the largest clubs in Scandinavia. Um, and for whatever reason, right at the end, last minute, uh, the club decided not, not to go ahead and, and sign me. So I had Syrianska there and... It was funny because the, the technical director there, when he signed me, he said, we already made one Iranian a superstar here. Can we make another one? Because obviously Saman had done well at Syrianska and moved to Ostersund where they, they had an amazing run in the Europa League. Um, but the experience in Sweden was was uh, was priceless and I enjoyed every second of it. Before we move on, I'm really interested to see how this process comes about because obviously, Navid, you injured yourself. That injury like sets back players. Like Some players don't even recover from that. So it's like one of those injuries that can be you know devastating. So my first question is like, how did you kind of come back from that and decide you want to carry on with football? But also like what the whole process is of finding a new club, especially when you're injured, you can't really showcase your your talent, your skill. And then you ended up like Sweden was the place that you wanted to go to. So I guess how does that whole process happen? Yeah, that was probably the most tough time a part of my life in terms of my career. It really took belief, faith and uh, and confidence in your own ability that I will get there one day. There is a lot of times when you're on your own and you're doing your rehab and you're in the dark, you have doubt. These feelings are natural. Now, I was unfortunate that when I did my cruciate, I decided to terminate my contract with Birmingham. So I didn't have the club's you know, support that a club would, would have given me. A lot of players nowadays even struggle to return from a cruciate injury with a club and with you know full-time physios. I tried to use my knowledge and my contacts to, to get myself back to where I needed to be. I used Mick Clegg, who was United's strength and conditioning coach. Um, I used John Davin, who was United's physio. These guys helped me massively and I'm forever owe my respect to them for, for helping me through that time. Now, once you become towards the end stage of the rehab, that's when you need to kind of use, I used my contacts for years of playing to try and get me to the best next step, which was for me, maybe going abroad and playing first team games in a professional environment, uh, instead of going and playing 21s football in in England somewhere again, like Birmingham or, uh, you know, Crew Alexandra, because I didn't think that was the best thing for my development. Was it around that time you were called to the U21s for Iran? Was it around that time you were Syrianska? Yeah, yeah, it was just just before I, before I'd gone to Syrianska. So I mean, what I want to ask you now, this is 
obviously this is probably the part that people will really be interested in, especially the Iranian football fans that are listening to this. What was it like coming into the Iranian national team setup under 21s, and how did they even contact you first? Yeah, so the contact came through uh, Carlos uh, directly in terms of he had obviously been aware, I think, of me through United's setup. He had reached out to me through Omid Namazi, which was one of his assistants. Obviously, uh, Omid was English speaking as well, and he was the connection between a lot of the players, I think, in Europe and, and Iran. So he contacted me regarding coming over, and it was really, really difficult um, in terms of organization wise and kind of setting up all the, the, the nitty gritty stuff of getting it over to Iran. In the end, um, when I did go over, my mum thankfully went over to Iran with me and she spent time with her family while I was in the camp. But the contact came from Carlos um, and from his knowledge of, of me playing in Europe. Of course, you know, it's Carlos Kiroz, we know how important he is to Iranian football nowadays. You know, we've got well over 20, 25 players playing in European top leagues and you know you are as well you know so it's really good to see but I mean of course I know Carlos Kiroz was the guy who contacted you but when you went to the U21 camp you obviously played a couple of friendlies you were involved with the you know with the training sessions but then afterwards what I really want to know this is really something that I think it doesn't really get questioned much to players is afterwards did you have any kind of a, a contact with the national team staff did the, the U21 staff did they still keep in touch with you were they still scouting you watching your matches uh, and even beyond that after like a, a year after was there still something to plan that was made for you I don't believe that they had a strong scouting network to continue on to see my progress back in Europe because once Carlos had sent his assistant as well, Markar, over to watch the training camp and the games, Ali Dustimer was the coach, Farshad Majedi as well was there. And I would keep in contact with Farshad a little bit more than the rest of them. But really, I didn't hear another word from the coach when I returned back to England. The only person who I had any contact with, again, was Carlos. And that was probably just from him his you know kind of knowledge and wisdom of knowing that we need to have some kind of connection back with Navid in order to see his development going forward and I was made aware like now I've come over to Ireland that they did keep tabs on players as the first team staff but the under 23s the under 21s and, and the under 19s I don't believe really was too interested in keeping tabs on the European boys you know the lads playing outside of Iran. And then obviously I know you've not been called up to the national team. Do you think there has been an improvement in that or no? The last time, kind of my last connection with the national team was was the last year that Carlos was there. And from what I believe, from what he you know said to me is as long as I was playing regularly in a in a good league in Europe, then I had every chance of being called up, whether it was to the Asian Games or I'd probably just missed out on any any squads towards the World Cup. Um but Having having getting that call up is obviously is, is a dream of mine, but I, I, without Carlos, I, I've had no real real contact from Tim Millie. You know, it's really interesting how you're mentioning Carlos every single time because at the end of the day, and this is something that I'm I'll be very vocal about and I'll defend fully is that end of the day, if anyone wants to you know attack Carlos Queiroz for whatever reason. They can never come to us and say that he was never important, vital for the European players, the European base players, because end of the day, those are the guys who are now pushing and driving the national team, you know, so it's really, very important that we recognize that and you're able to show us a bit of an insight into what actually went down. So I appreciate that. Of course, and I think it's invaluable to know how much he, he did for the country and for, for Team Melli. I think everybody can see that, and if anyone is trying to tell us otherwise, uh, they're pulling wool over our eyes. Because if you look at other national teams, uh, setups all over the world, even players who aren't getting called up, who could potentially be called up, they sometimes have a bit of feedback between the federations to say, listen, this is where you are. This is how you stand. If you can get to this stage, then we would be delighted to invite you or you need to do this in order to be, you know, they kind of want to help their nation grow on the pitch. And in order to do that, they need to use all their resources to say and and look at every player potentially being eligible to, to be called up. So, you know, as, as I said, any country would look at any player who is who would be eligible to get called up and, and try and help them in order to get the best out of themselves in order to help the national team. I think that's a really good point, actually. And I think like our, in our previous podcast, we talked a lot about Sayed Azatollahi and 
how I guess he should have been in this in the upcoming squad, but he hasn't. He's kind of been excluded. And like, I think that's a really good point you alluded to, where you like if if they make sort of like promises or if they if they push you to go to a certain direction because you want to get a national team call up like that there should be an ongoing conversation and people should keep tabs on you otherwise like i don't know it just it just feels like you're working on your own like it, it feels like you're just working towards i don't know like you, you, there's no prospect of getting called up the question is would it happen in england would it happen in scotland no because yeah, they'll yeah. go after the like the players, exactly. and look at there's a player called Jack Harper played in, in Malaga in a Spanish second division, and he was still getting like selected for U21s and all that, you know. And it's like, come on, man, we need to get these players available, you know, opportunities because we're we're one of the best teams in Asia. Absolutely, I think let's just talk about development and development of potential players who could play for Iran. Um, have we utilised that to every extent? 100% no. Would Gareth Southgate or even, you know, AD Boothroyd at the 21s in England, would they reach out to players who are playing in Europe who are eligible to play for England? Yeah, and would Scotland do the same? Absolutely. Um, but Iran, for example, you know, having not just myself, other players who have Iranian descent eligible, it has no harm in them to de- invite them see how they are developing, see them in person, how they work, their potential. And then, you know, further down the line, they can keep tabs on them. And if they believe they're good enough, then they can call them up again. But, you know, we see very rare that any player of Iranian descent is getting called up to the youth setups. It kind of only happened, you know, since Carlos came in and and, and really drove that factor of we can, you know, invite European players or players from around the world who are Iranian because we are Iranian in our blood. Yeah, I, I think you make some amazing points and like it very much mirrors what we talked about in the previous podcast as well, which is which is really interesting. So Navid, I want I want to move on actually to when you returned to England with League One side Gillingham and obviously like you scored against MK Dons in, in like the the two seasons you were there. How did that whole process come about? Like like what was the decision making process like? Uh, and like did you enjoy your time there? Yeah, um, when the season was finished, and obviously in, in Sweden, the Scandinavian league finishes uh, around November time. So my off-season that year was in December. I had an option of another year to stay in Sweden if I wanted to, but my, my aim was always to return to England and, and play in the top two, three leagues if possible. Um, so my agent had, had contact with Gillingham. They were interested in me. Um, so when the opportunity came, you know, I took it with two hands. It took me a little bit of time to get into the team. Um, I actually scored on my debut against MK Dons, as you, as you said, and um, things were going really well. I was I was actually supposed to sign a, a longer term contract there, which ended up falling through uh, just with the politics of how football can be. Um, but once I was there, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I, it was good for my development. It was difficult at times just personally with the changing room and, and, and sometimes with the coach. But being over in England and, and playing at the highest level possible is, is kind of my goal. Um, and, and obviously, alongside that, would hopefully go a team early call. However, you did actually move on again to a different uh, part of the UK this time. You moved to Northern Irish League. Glenn Torrent signed you. And of course, the move came about because the coach is still the coach as well for Glenn Torrent is Mick McDermott, who was the fitness coach for Iran under Carlos Kairos towards the end of his reign. And he was the one who, who essentially brought you into the team. Can you give us a little bit more information about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mick had contacted me. He was made aware that I was out of contract. And he called me up, basically explained to me that they have an Iranian owner as well, um, Glenn Torrens' owner. Um, is, you know, he's Persian. He lives in London. And he just said that he would he would you know be delighted for me to to come over and see and see the club for myself. So I flew out over to Belfast, um, kind of spent some time with Mick, learned his personality. We were already both aware, you know, we knew of each other. We didn't knew, know each other personally. We, I I knew who he was, and I think he was aware of me. He told me that um, him and Oceana had had come over to watch a couple of my games whilst I was at Gillingham. Um, now I, I didn't know that until I'd obviously met him. But that was an interesting, an interesting point that he told me. And once I came over, then you know I, I liked what I saw, and I decided that it would be a, a good next step. I want to just quickly point out that Oceano Cruz was, was the assistant coach under Carlos Kairos for a very long time, and Mick McDermott was the fitness coach. Kairos sent him to watch those games, didn't he? And I think he also watched Tafazoli as well when he was at Peterborough. Am I right in saying? 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think they were responsible for the UK players. Um, I think different coaches or different departments or uh, people of, uh, of Carlos's uh, backroom staff would be responsible for maybe different regions going over to Holland or, or Scandinavia to, to scout players. Yeah, it's interesting how Carlos Queiroz was still keeping an eye on you even after as well, even after he finished with the national team. Yeah, yeah, of course. It was, yeah, it just kind of shows how much passion he had for the country and the team. The next step, the next step for you um, was then you signed with Linfield, which which you're currently playing for, um, which is, you know, the reigning champions of the league. So how was that whole process and how are you, how are you finding it at the moment? Yeah, obviously I'm delighted. Um, it was the next step that I wanted to take in terms of moving to the to the to the biggest club in the country you know it, there's a lot of controversy around the decision just due to obviously the background between the two clubs and the history that the two clubs have but you know my contract was finished uh, Linfield had, had approached me about about coming over and just the fact that they had qualified for the Champions League um, you know qualifying stages I, I couldn't really turn down the option I wanted to, to be part of the European setup so I've enjoyed my time here so far. I think there's definitely more to come. We had, uh, unfortunately, with COVID, we all the games we played were without fans. So we went over to Legia Warsaw, and, and the stadium was empty, which would have been an amazing atmosphere. And obviously, the leg, uh, the games were only single leg games, where they normally would have been two legs. So we didn't get as far as we would have liked to. Um, but you know, no, nonetheless, it was a great experience, and I hope we can I can experience more European football further in my career. Yeah, I mean, that must be like a big dream come true, like playing in obviously the Champions League and Europa League qualifying rounds and obviously like going to Poland as well and, and playing, you know, having a taste of, of you know, European football. Uh, I guess, like, how was that experience? Because it is like a dream come true for a lot of players. Yeah, you know, I would actually spoken to my family after I got back and I said that I would rather be part of a of kind of the best team in a country and, and and be able to potentially qualify for the group stage of the European competition than to kind of play in a third division in England where you're never really going to have the opportunity to potentially get to that stage. It was a real, I can't even explain, the atmosphere and the experience was priceless and the feeling that you get uh, during that, the, that run of games, um, it's really invaluable and it's something, as you said, like you only dream of it as a young boy. You're an experienced hunter, Navi, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I try <laughs> I try to be, try to be. Um, fair, fair. I, feel like, I feel like at the age of 24, I've kind of been everywhere and and and, and seen a lot, and um, you know I'm grateful for that. Yeah, and how is the season going so far with Linfield? And obviously you had the coronavirus issue this season. How's it going? Yeah, it's it's really strange this year. You know we're playing. Unfortunately, I haven't even played in front of our fans properly yet. So since I arrived here with coronavirus, everything's kind of been in. We've been in lockdown, so we're playing in empty stadiums. The team's doing well. You know, we're top of the league. Hopefully, we can continue on that on and, and, and win the league. But we haven't started the cup competition yet. And and personally, I feel like there's a lot more to come. Um, uh, you know, I've contributed um, well. And I, as I said, I think there's, there's still more to come and, and we can push on from here. Uh, as I said, as I said oh, we'd love to see the national team at some point. But what's your kind of aspirations then, national team wise? You know, where would you need to, what would you need to do to get somebody like Dragan Skocic to to look at you to make sure you're you're available for national team camps in the future? What do you have to do? Do you think? Well, at this current moment in time, I'm actually unaware if you know I'm still on their radar in sense that obviously with the new coach uh, come in. However, like as I said, Farshad Majadi is still, I think, involved in some sort of setup in the federation. But I have had no contact from them since Kairos left. Um, it would be nice, uh, you know, to have have maybe some contact to, to know where I'm up to. But from my point of view, I believe that if I can get to um, a top league again and playing regular football, and even at Linfield, I believe that if I can, you know, push on and, and we can do well in Europe, and I'm having a good season personally, then. I don't see any reason why I should be stopped from getting a call up because I believe that the good that I could bring to the team would would be something that would be different from a lot of other players. So I, I feel like it's still definitely a potential uh, of doing it here at Linfield. And if not, then it would be uh, maybe at another club, uh, hopefully further on in my career. So, I mean, in terms of obviously getting into the national team, there's one way that you could possibly get scouted, uh, especially if your current club is obviously the UEFA Conference League is now a 
that's coming into to, to football next season. And if your team manages to, to get to that somehow, do you think that would be a good possibility for, for scouting for, from the national team? Yeah, definitely. So obviously, you know, we've been made aware that next year there will it's kind of different. So I think we'll have one Champions League qualifier game. Uh, obviously, if we lose that, then we go into the Europa League qualifying game. Losing that, then you you go into the next one, which is the is the com, you know the Conference League, um, and I think in order to qualify for that, the revenue is almost equal to um, the Europa League. So the exposure that will then generate from some of the clubs that will be involved in that will will be second to none, and I hope that would be then enough, you know, to to, to have some national team exposure, because uh, if you just think of some of the it's the kind of the top clubs in maybe smaller countries like Northern Ireland. Um, who would then be playing against each other and, and they would still sell out stadiums. I don't know too much about it myself, but, you know, the club kind of glanced upon it that we will almost be guaranteed two or three games as opposed yeah. to just one, one or two games. Navid, you mentioned how, like, you, you prefer, and you, I mean, you, you, you talked to your parents about this, how you'd prefer to play, you know, at the top of, like, a Northern Ireland. Irish club, for instance, like Northern Irish League, uh, rather than playing the lower divisions of an English league. Is that still something that you kind of think about when you're choosing your next step? Obviously, like with the national team, call up maybe in the back of your mind. Yeah, definitely. I think once you obviously get to a certain age, then your aspirations change, your mentality changes. But, you know, being 24 and I think, you know, still coming up to my prime, choosing which club or what step I take next definitely has an influence on whether I can make that national team spot. So, you know, if someone asked me to do you want to rather play in League Two or go over to maybe a top team in Norway, I would rather go over to Norway, regardless of the money and the financial side of things, because right now in my career, you know, I'm driven to play the highest level possible, develop under a good coach playing in a good club with, with good fan base and then getting that exposure in maybe Europe where that would help me get a, a national team call up it's an interesting point actually I haven't thought about it that much but you actually it makes a lot more sense like it does make a lot more sense because the exposure that you get as an individual is kind of a lot more than if you played in say like league two yeah and even even a lot of league one clubs um I had this discussion with Mick as well uh, while I was at Glen Torren just regarding how they look at things, because it's interesting to see how they do. Um, and I know, like, they don't look as, they don't respect, shall I say, a League One as much as maybe someone playing in, in Holland, even at a weaker team in Eredivisie, just because of the level of competition or the style of football. It doesn't suit, you know, international football as much. Whereas playing in a, in a, in a league where it's a top division, um, the style of football almost suits international football more and then therefore you're more likely to, to be called up. In terms of like financials as a, as a, as a football player and an athlete, uh, playing in, in League One and League Two would probably much, be much more beneficial than, than playing in, in a, like a Scandinavian country. Um, but sometimes it, it doesn't outweigh what you would do in the future and, and, and where you want to you know see yourself and where you want to be in your career so like iran's world cup 2022 qualifications what are your kind of like i guess looking at it from as as a fan and also like potentially as a call up maybe in, in a couple years time how do you kind of see the progress going for that and i guess like what are your thoughts on the current setup and all, all of that stuff yeah i think it's been definitely difficult with um obviously wilmot's coming in leaving and all the kind of controversy and mess that was left behind and then to you know take a new coach in the middle of a campaign has is difficult as it is as difficult as the campaigns are and then to have all that mess on top of it so i just hope you know fingers crossed that they can they can solve it and we can qualify going forward to the world cup because then you know it opens so many doors for for reigning football for us players and as a nation it definitely brings us all together as one so I just hope, you know, they, whether I'm involved or not, you know, they qualify for the World Cup and, and then get and do well and, and you know, push forward. Yeah, we hope so. And so what are your personal goals for the future then? Um, where do you want to see, where do you see yourself later on in your, in your career, maybe just in the next couple of years as well? Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, I've still I've still got so much to offer in terms of playing at the highest level I can. I don't think I've reached that yet. So whether that's you know the championship, the Premier League, or, or another club in Europe, uh, or another league in Europe, I I don't know where it is. I will you know try my best to maximise that potential, and then along with that, as I said, like playing for Team Melly would be a dream come true, and I hope that one day I can put the shirt on and and um, and help the team and help the country. Any messages for the Iranian fans listening? 
Um, I don't know what to say, man. Um, Put you on the spot I, there, man. I know, man. <laughs> I was going to say something in Farsi, and then I was thinking... Wiggle, wiggle. No, please. Sure. Nah, go on, then. <laughs> امیدوارم که همه بچه ها که تو این وضعیت کرونا که توش هستیم خوب بشن و میتونیم همه موفقیت خوبی داشته باشیم و تیم ملی انشالله واسه جام جهانی کوالیفای بشن و بریم جلو با هم دیگه اوه <laughs> I had like yeah, a bit of English. I had to do it, man. Yeah, so thank you so much for for joining us, listening to this episode of Gold Bazan. My name's been Sina. I'll be joined by Arya, and of course our special guest Navid Nasari. So yeah, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, and if you're listening to us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to not miss our next episodes as well. And yeah, you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We're on all good podcast platforms. So we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Hello, my name is Alaya Sayed Manish. You're listening to Gold Bazan Podcast.